Good, good afternoon, everybody. I think most of the people in here know who I am. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on the uh, capabilities we've got in composites. <clears throat> and then I will hand over to John Vickers, who's going to run through one of our use cases as well, which is uh, just completed. So opportunities for graphene within composites and polymers. Obviously, I think a lot of you know what these opportunities are now. Thermal management, impact protection, stronger, tougher materials, chemical resistance. Um, with thermal management, it's not just in, in composite materials, it's in uh, coppers and metallics as well. Um, it's also covering different areas, so from your mobile phones to automotive to aerospace, everything where you see um, high temperatures, graphene can be used to manage those uh, temperatures and how we cool those areas down. Also, light weighting, that's a massive area we've been looking at. I think everyone's seen the BAC Mono downstairs, and um, that's the first production car to be developed using graphene materials. And just in the body weight alone, there was a saving of nine kilos from the original car that was built. Overall, it was a, a 55 kilo saving after taking the weight of everything they've done all together. So that was a big thing for us. Uh, structural composites, uh, wing structures, uh, wind turbine blades is a big area we're looking at. Hydrogen storage tanks, uh, electrical conductivity, lightning strike. We've got uh, one of our partners who's got materials out there already in the market, which are used for lightning strike panels on aircraft and wind turbine blades. So just running through our equipment and the areas that we focus on within composites. So fabric reinforced plastics first. Um, we have a small autoclave downstairs where we process our fabric reinforced plastics. So from pre-pregs, so epoxy resins through to thermoplastics. So there's a lot of areas now where they're looking to try to get away from thermoset materials, looking into thermoplastics for recyclability as well. So that sustainability is a big area for <laughs> graphene and 2D materials. Uh, out of autoclave systems, um, industry is looking at different ways of getting away from autoclaves, trying to keep autoclaves for your high-end uh, products, low volume but high-end, so those which need a better surface finish, um, better um, product uh, what was it, shape or full ability into the mold tools, um, whereas now with a um, Fabric for plastic in the ovens, they are looking at cheaper ways of processing those materials to get it more realistically into the, uh, the market where composites have been struggling uh, recently. Also from that, for your high volume uh, products, so say anything over 500 parts per, per year, they're looking to process it in, um, in a press. So we basically load the tool into the press and then they can punch out part after part after part. Um, one of the things with those is surface finish, and we found that um, using graphene tooling materials can help with surface finish, specifically in tooling uh, materials as well. Uh, so automotive are certainly looking at these areas for snap cure resins, so we're looking at adding 2D materials to those snap cure resins to help um, speed up those cure cycles, cooling down, heating up, uh, press versus making them more affordable. So moving on to polymer processing, our biggest area that we actually work in within the, in the geek for me for, for composites is the polymer processing, our twin screw extruder. It's a modular system, so we can use um, different single screw, twin screw, and then we can attach different modules on the end of that as well, which I'll go through in a second. So anything from LDPEs all the way up to peaks, up to 450 degrees C, we can, we can process in the, the twin screw extruder. <coughs> So from that, we can also produce pellets, blown films, cast films, and fibers, which we then move on to. Taking the different materials we do produce from between a twin screw and single screw, we can then use in the injection molder. So we're producing uh, whether it's test specimens for tensile bars, Sharpie, anything that you guys want to test within that arena, we can produce a test bars for reasonably. And um, anything from also wear resistance and things like that as well. We could produce plaques which we can adapt to fit different sorts of tests we want to do. <clears throat> also going from single screw, also we can uh, produce fibers. So we've got a fiber explore line where we um, condition the actual fibers. We take the monofilaments from the actual single screw, put it through a fiber explore line to condition it and we can actually stretch those uh, filaments down to I think it's what, 0 0.5 antimicrons now, which we're actually producing uh, fibres which are from industry, uh, the company that uh, we've been working with, and those are now working trying to get those into products as well. Also, elastomer processing um, from natural rubbers down to uh, SPRs as well. 
uh, we've got our internal mixer. It's only a small internal mixer. We can only do small amounts, but it just proves a point. It's more for pilot scale testing and proving that um, we can process and actually get 2D materials into those materials as well. <clears throat> so multiple screw types. And also we, one polymer we can't use in our uh, twin screw extruder is PVC, but we can uh, process PVC within this uh, internal mixer as well. But following on from the actual process of elastomers, from internal mixer, goes into a two-roll mill. So again, small scale, we can do up to 100, I guess, uh, 30 degrees C in this, 115 mil wide, we can make sheets, and then we can get those sheets, and then we uh, vulcanize those uh, sheets of rubber in the um, small press again. Yeah. So moving on again, MMCs is an area where we're just uh, getting into. Uh, we, I've got a few projects now looking around uh, copper, which Zeshin is working on. Zeshin is in the room somewhere. Uh, so spark plasma synthesis, well, they, it's an up-and-coming market for us. We're not getting a lot of traction in, in here, but we've had um, high-end jewelers who are working on ceramics as well, which uh, one of the partners worked on previously when they worked for us. And then also, like I say, copper and aluminium. But it's, uh, it's a difficult material for us to get 2D materials into. It seems to not take the material, so proving it and... I think it's going to be different types of 2D materials which will find the advantage most in this rather than, than graphene. So I'm just going to hand over to Johnny's going to run through his use case. Kilton. Oh, I was, I was in a yeah, book. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, John Vickers, I'm a senior application specialist within the Comp 16, mainly focusing on further plastics. Um, what we did was uh, produce some P straight wall bottles, uh, enhanced with graphene, uh, which we mainly did for the show, just so we can uh, show you that uh, we can make in the lab and also interact with industry in making bottles. So, uh, our <coughs> so main advantages of using graphene in bottles, obviously you're looking at barrier properties, one of the key areas, uh, mechanical properties with uh, top loading being the main or stacking being the main uh, area of interest. Um, also, uh, you get resistance to UV when you put graphene in. So PET is susceptible to uh, UV radiation. So adding a bit of graphene in there can prolong the light of our hole. Uh, light weighting of the article, everyone's talking about that. Um, and that's something that we will be looking at uh, later on in another project. Uh, and also the graphene can actually help with energy consumption. So the way the uh, heaters, uh, the, way the, the way the preform is heated, so the absorption of heat into the preform, so it's like a process improvement that you can reduce energy overall, and that's a good saving for your process, cost point of view. Uh, material that we, we used in the bottles, you will see the bottles on a couple of the partner stands and some of the geek stands as well. If you've been walking around, you'll see these. So the PET blend that we used was actually putting 50% of recycled PET in with 50% of a, a virgin or a new material. So we, we've got the recycled in there as part of the process availability. You could make bottles out 100% recycled. That's not a problem. For this project, we just had a, a look-see. And obviously the graphings that we used were the nano platelets, so a GMP. Um, how we manufactured that, so they were made um, on the injection stretch bar molder, it's a, it's a NISI, uh, ABS 50, so it's a 50 machine. Um, that actually was in the industry. Um, there the bottles were made. These bottles are actually 25 gram, and, and call them straight wolf, the cosmetic industry. Um, it's a 250 milliliter bulb. Um, so these are the kind of things you might see in your back room with your hair conditioner and shampoo and stuff like that. Um, so what I decided to do was a very low loading master batch because I didn't want a lot of graphene in there. So I took a 0.05% graphene loaded and used it as a master batch, very low loading. And I dosed that into um, our, our couple of levels to see what we, we would get. So the aim was to get in as little as possible. So obviously the top line there is the PET 
natural blend. Um, so formulation one, the graphene, I got down as low as um, 1.5 milligrams or 0.006% of uh, graphene in the final bottle or 0.015 grams. And, and as you can see, I just did a, a step change so I, I don't start master about 3%, 5%, and 10%. Um, so that was the levels we got in. And as you can see, as you go from left to right, you didn't get a slight increase in darkness because you're adding more graphene. But if you have seen these bottles around the uh, exhibition stands, you see that still are transparent, you can still see through them. Uh, also, what is important from this slide, please on the bottle wall thickness. Uh, as you can see, the PET blend, so that's the uh, uh, 0.45 is the standard thickness for this uh, bottle. That's what's made every day. Um, and what I noticed was that with the more graphing we put in, the rheology changed and it actually did have an effect on the distribution of the material. This is something I found out later on. Because this was done in industry, I couldn't go back straight away and correct that. So we've done the test on what on a look seat. We've got some quite interesting results. Uh, the first one is on the transmission rate of water vapor. Um, and as you can see, everything is below uh, the natural, which is good. So you want a minus number. The variation on the natural was, was massive. So formulation two and formulation three are within the error bar. So you could say there's really no significant difference, even though there was certainly 40 odd percent improvement in barrier. So I think there was, there was something going on with their process that I would like to look at just to make that even more stable on the uh, initial um, manufacturing of the natural. So because there wasn't much difference between the bottom wall thickness, we were seeing uh, real data coming in on the um, F1 <coughs> graphene formulation, which nearly 83% improvement against the natural. Well, that is really good data. Um, and what I'm looking and I'm wanting to do is go back and actually look at F2 and F3 and optimize them conditions for that, that bubble. It's all about the viscosity. When you're adding graphene, you get a change in viscosity. It's similar, it's all a similar kind of pattern with the top loads with the compression test stacking. Again, now we want a positive number because we want, uh, we want it to retain force. F1 again gave us a positive 23%, uh, just under. So that was good. But then the F2 and the F3, again, because of the bottle wall thickness, was giving us negative numbers because the wall thickness is less than what the natural is by about 0.05 millimeters. And that's quite a lot in this industry for bottle manufacturing. So again, with optimization of F2 and F3, um, I believe that we can improve uh, them, them results to give us better results overall. So yeah, uh, like I've just said, I think it's due to the wall fitness variation uh, and it's the rheology changing so the intrinsic viscosity is changing. Um, but if you look at the F1, because you've got better barrier and because you've got better top load, there's nothing stopping you having a, a look at trying to lightweight that formulation because it's, it's, it's got the uh, it's got all the improvements that you need. You could probably then look at changing the, um, the stretching and the blowing in the process to give you a performance that's better at 0.006% master batch in the final. That's something we, we need to do and have a look and see if we can improve that. So briefly, uh, so you can use graphene in PET, no problem with that. We've seen that across other PET bottles as well, other projects. The F1 was the best, uh, and I think Lyrene could be considered within that bowl. Um, 
we need to, we need, I need to change the processing parameters on F2 and F3 to, to improve that, that top load. It's top load that's really the issue, not the barrier. But I think that will just fall into place when we sort out the uh, load distribution. Um, and what I find is that actually the graphene is acting like a process stabilizer um, because overall, the error bars on the uh, testing of the graphene were very small compared to the natural. And not only do I see that on PET, but I see that across all other working uh, projects that I do, that actually the error bars on, um, on the formulation of graphene are a lot smaller than the natural. So that's, that's quite interesting that something like this is coming up, where you could look at taking out certain process process stabilizers within polymers and use graphene instead to give you not only processing conditions but other mechanical or physical properties improvements that you might be after so there's an, a nice area of investigation that could be uh looking at so what we want to do next step is obviously process optimization um so stabilizing that wall thickness uh getting that right i think we'll be bang on for this project and also as I said because you've got black in there or the graphene is acting as black body radiation the energy reduction that you need to blow the bubble can be significant significantly less as an example we did it I did a quick calculation and I was only about eight percent on uh, overall reduction but I think that could be taken further with the optimization but overall you're reducing your energy consumption so therefore you're reducing your costs so everyone's a winner. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much.